these folks sat in your seats. <laughs> and so uh, they were here at one time in the last three or four years. And if it lives for you and then you take in this instruction and God is calling you to serve and to live out your life in the Catholic Church, we'd love to have you. It's just a, it's a great community. So very good. Okay. So um, the question is, um, what brought you here tonight? And some of you may have put a little ditty on your uh, sign-in sheet there. What brought you here tonight? You know, something brought you here. Was it a lifelong interest? There's one woman that I ministered to. She's in a nursing home now. She said, I always wanted to do this, like from age seven. And now she's probably in her 60s. And she has just now come to do it, you know. So we brought her into church two years ago. But maybe it's curiosity. Maybe you hear questions, you know, and I don't know how to answer those questions about the Catholic Church and you want to know. Maybe it's a friend, maybe it's a persistent spouse. <laughs> maybe it's a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Um, that was Sunday, a guy after mass comes out and he said, after the 11 o'clock mass, and he said he'd like to come in and his girlfriend kind of smiled and she said, it's because of me. <laughs> She's been guiding him to come and check out the Catholic church, okay? So I know that coming here tonight may have been no big deal to some of you, but for some of you, it may have been a big deal. You know, it takes a lot of courage. It would take a lot of courage for me to go into church that's not my church and say, hmm, maybe you could tell me well, what you do. You know, it's kind of like you're putting yourself at risk. You're very vulnerable when you do that. But I do hope that you'll feel very comfortable here. I don't ask any tough questions. No, don't ask any questions. And uh, you can uh, be free to come and go. And there's no pressure. There's no pressure. If you ever come into church, it has to be because you want to come into church and you do it fully and you do it freely and God bless you. So please feel no pressure here uh, from us. I hope you feel comfortable. And so congratulations. And the question still exists, you know, why are you here? And maybe there are people that seek baptism. You know, there are adults that have not been baptized as children or infants. We, in the Catholic church, we baptize early and we're going to explain why. But if you've not been baptized, that may be something you're thinking about. You know, we say that we're born as creatures of God all of us were born as creatures and we have original sin on our soul, the sin of Adam. And then we uh, are born again when we undergo the waters of baptism and we go from being a creature of God to a child of God. And it's a huge difference. You know, it's like when we just had our school principal adopted his second baby, they can't have children. And this little baby, um, I didn't get to hold her because of COVID, but the mom was out here this past week, two weeks old, adopted baby and uh, it's theirs. And that's what God does in baptism. He adopts us into his family. We're born, then we're born again with his Holy Spirit. Now, original sin is gone. In comes the Holy Spirit, and we're children of God. And that's a big deal. So maybe you're not baptized, the people that are here. And if so, that would be something to consider because, you know, um, being born again is, is, is huge. And maybe some of you are already baptized and you're already in God's family. And so we're brothers and sisters in Jesus. But you want to say, gee, how could I... Uh, kind of lift some of the sin that I've committed through my life. Was there a formal way to do that? And there is in the Catholic Church, instituted by Jesus in John 20, you know, where he says the sin, he gave power to mere men, the bishops, the apostles. He said, the sins you forgive are forgiven and the sins you hold bound are held bound. And so through the power of the Holy Spirit and the hands of the priest, we have the permission of Jesus to forgive sin. And what a great feeling that is. You know, if you've ever done something wrong and then mom says it's okay or dad says it's okay or your wife, or it's like, you know, and to hear the words of Jesus say, I absolve you of your sin. Get up, go forward, go on. You're clean. That is huge. So for those two sacraments alone, you know, uh, holy, com holy baptism, holy confession, and of course, holy communion. Uh, by Jesus' design, you know, he uh, said, I'll, leave you. I'll never leave you. I'll be with you always. And he is. He's with us sacramentally. He's with us hidden, veiled under the appearance of bread. Uh, he's there. And so we can receive Jesus in holy communion. And that's called, he said, I am the bread from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And so I celebrate mass as a Catholic priest every day, every day. Uh, we call down the Holy Spirit and the unleavened bread that is brought forward is transubstantiated miraculously changed into him, and then we can feed on him. And that's one reason many people would like to consider the Catholic Church, you know, uh, to be fed from above, to be fed with uh, bread from heaven. And so I hope you feel comfortable. And those are some of the things you may be thinking about. You don't need to answer or whatever, but let that percolate. And uh, I do want to give you a quote from one of my former parishioners up there, Jim Jernigan. Remember Jim Jernigan, uh, Isabella? He's a big guy and what a wonderful man. And he's a convert. When I first went to that parish, Jim came over to me. He said, Father, he says, I'm a convert. He says, you know, I gave up nothing and I gained everything. 
know, a lot of people fear if they come into the Catholic Church, you have to give up all your friends or something like that. I don't know where that came from, but no, hold on to your friends. They're all family. If we're baptized, we're all brothers and sisters. But he gained a lot. He gained Holy Communion, Holy Confession, Holy Anointing. We're going to talk about some of those things. How many come in the Catholic Church? You know, on a global basis in the United States, in one year, 100,000 people will choose to become Catholic. Now, that's not counting the babies. There's a million babies that are baptized, and you, you would say it's not their choice. Mom and dad wanted that gift for them. But there's 100,000 adults that come into the Catholic Church in the United States every year. In this diocese of ours, which is the northern half of Alabama, 500 come in typically every year, 500 people. And in our parish, like you saw from our pictures there, on average, let's say 12, probably 12 people in our little parish uh, come in the church. Why do they come? Some people want to be in the church that Jesus started, you know, right there in Matthew 16 of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In Matthew 16, Jesus says to Peter, you are rock, and on this church, on this rock, I'll build my church. And it really is the only church that's in the Bible. Where Jesus speaks, he said, it's my church. I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. He says that. And so to be in the very church that our Lord started 2,000 years ago is really, really something, you know. Every other church that's around today has been started by a man or a woman. So you have a man or woman, which are fallible. Then you have the infallible God, and he started that church. And so, so we have maybe a review of some of the sacraments. Here you go. Uh, to have access to, there are seven sacraments that we treasure and that we celebrate. And there's three of them that you can repeat. Okay, you never, don't repeat bas baptism. Hopefully you don't repeat marriage. You don't repeat holy orders. And you don't repeat, you know, um, the last rites where you receive that before you die. But here again, holy confession, which you can go to regularly and ask God for forgiveness and receive reconciliation and absolution. And then holy communion, nourished with bread from above. And you can do that once a day for the rest of your life. And then holy anointing. Uh, all these people that are sick in the hospital, if they ask, I go there and I bring the holy oil and we pray for their recovery and my, or their peace of mind and, and, uh, and the recovery of their body. And so uh, that's a great grace, and it's in Scripture. And we're going to go through all the sacraments. If you hang in there, it's on your syllabus there on what we're going to do. So that's what, the, what is before us. What is the process of entering the Catholic Church? And I think we have a slide on this too. And uh, we have an acronym, folks, and you may have seen it in the advertising that brought you here. And so there it is. So it's not R-I-G-H-T, but right. That would be like a ritual or a ceremony or something that we do. That's the right of Christian initiation of adults. So that program started in the 1960s to kind of formalize these classes and allow adults, the right of Christian initiation of adults, to really explore the Catholic Church and uh, maybe consider coming in. So that's what you're in right now is one of those classes. But it's a mouthful when you say the right of Christian initiation of adults. And I have my own understanding of RCIA, and I call RCIA Roman Catholic Inquiries and Answers, okay? Because you came here with questions, you know, do you guys do this with Mary? Do you worship her? No, we don't. I, mean, I don't know how that got out there, but what do you do in this and that? So come with your questions, your inquiries, and then we'll try our very best to give you the answers. And then you take it from there. That's what, that's what we'd like to do. And we have a question box. It's on the end of that table there. It's blue. It says question box. And if at any time you think of a question that you don't want to raise your hand and ask, then go ahead and write it down and put it in there. And then at the beginning of next class, I'll just answer them anonymously if you choose. Or you can talk to me after class. I stay after class if we had an individual, an individual question. You know, when I taught at the high school, at the high school level there, I told those students, I said, don't you dare leave, you know, your time here at John Carroll Catholic High School for non-Catholic and not know at least what the Catholic Church teaches and preaches. Get your questions answered, you know. And so they took it up on that and they, they would ask good questions and know why, 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 why. And that, that, uh, that's a good thing. So be inquisitive if you, if you choose. Okay. So I know when you go to UA and all that, you want to know who the heck is the teacher? Who is the teacher that's going to be teaching me the course material and what's their background and what's their teaching? And so I'd like to take a peek in your notebook there. We have some handouts. And in your notebook there, there's a, uh, one sheet that says, the training required to serve as a Catholic priest. If you could look at that just for a minute, just for a minute, kind of help you give you an overview. Like I say, when, when we went there, I'm an engineer. <laughs> so
So to do philosophy and theology was like a different realm, a real different realm. But it was so good. I had had some philosophy at Auburn, and they, that's why they took off one year. I had some good philosophy there. But that's, this is what we are trained in, those and many more. These are six of the highlights of our training as a Catholic priest in the five years of seminary. And one is philosophy. That's the love of wisdom. That's what it is. And you've had philosophers all through the ages, Catholic and non-Catholic, Christian and non-Christian, and they're trying to go and, and get deep into philosophical thought. Epistemology. Wow, what is epistemology? You know, that's um, uh, the study of wisdom. What can I know? How can I know? And can I be sure of anything I know? That's epistemology, okay? Ontology. Ontology is the study of being, okay? We say that we're human beings, okay? And we say that God is being itself, okay? So we're like a subset of that. So it gets real deep. This is philosophy. Ontology is the study of being, okay? And then logic. So good, so powerful. That can be secular or can be um, Christian. Then the big one there, it's, uh, there's too much to put down, but sacred scripture. We're in sacred scripture every day. I mean, we study it backwards and forward. You know, the first five books, the Pentateuch, and then we study just the, uh, the, the Gospels, and then we study just John, and then we study just Hebrews, and we go through the Bible back and forth. Every semester, there's a different way to look at the uh, books of the Bible, the historical books, the prophetic books, and all of that. And so we're always in the Word of God. That's the written Word of God. Systematic theology, look at that, the Trinity. We study the Trinity for one semester. God cannot be explained, and yet we study him. It's like we're going to finally understand him. And it's like, no, uh, that's why we worship God. St. Augustine once said, uh, anyone that I can anything that I can explain isn't worth my adoration worship. If we could explain God, it would be like I could explain, you know, and it's nothing special. But we try to study Christology, the study of the Christ event. Ecclesiology is the study of the church. Mariology is a deep look at the mother of God. God handpicked Mary to be the mother of the Savior. Soteriology is the study of salvation. Eschatology is the study of the end times. Anthropology is our human makeup, you know, that God took on our human nature and became a man. And how important that is that he did that so that we can relate to him. Dogmatic theology, Catholic theology, we get immersed. Moral theology, the study of God's guidelines. You know, he said, you shall do this and you shall not do this. From a moral standpoint, what is it that involves grace and sin? Historical theology, we study, we have 2,000 years of the Catholic Church, but we go way back. We study the patristics, um, the different spiritualities, all kinds of prayer, liturgy, law. Then pastoral theology, you know, as priests, what would we need to be to be guiding the people? We need to know how to teach. We need to know how to preach, counsel. We spent a whole summer in hospital chaplaincy so I can be bedside with so many people. We do that for a whole summer. Spiritual direction, um, those are some of the dimensions. So, you know, I would hope that you would think that you're learning from a person who's been kind of at least formed, formally, in a lot of areas there that are so important, so important to getting the straight scoop, the straight scoop on, on what we're going to try to learn. Okay, I think we're going to look at our schedule now. Okay, please. Very good. So what we do is we usually begin in September, and there's usually about 25 different topics that we try to cover before Easter. Now, Easter can be within 30 days. You know, it can be as early as March and late as April. And so we try to finish around that time frame. And so the, this will carry us through the end of the year right here. And so if you have your sheet in front of you, that's the green sheet. That's your cover sheet. And just take a peek at some of those things, and I hope you find them most Intriguing. Let me see if I got a copy here. Early on in our time together, you know, I don't know where you're coming from. There may be people in here that are not baptized. There may be people that have never been to church. I know I've met some at church, and I think that's great. So we're trying to start at a high level. We're going to talk about God and revelation. And then next week, we're going to get a little bit deeper. We're going to go Bible and catechism. And then we're going to talk about the great question that many people ask, are you saved? Are you saved? And how do you answer that, you know? Some of us Catholics can become tongue-tied tongue when someone says, are you saved? But that's because there's such a broad answer. And so we're going to go over that. That's a whole class on, are you saved? And it's a beautiful um, way to understand um, justification, as Paul says, justification, sanctification, and redemption. And then marriage. You know, what is the Catholic take on marriage and divorce? And this whole idea of annulment. So we're going to take a look at God's design for marriage. Heaven, hell, and purgatory. What is purgatory? Where did that come from, you know? And so that's another one. These early classes are very good and kind of broaden your um, thirst and your hunger to explore, you know, what is it that you believe? And guess what? It's all scriptural. 
we have Bibles for available. To, we'll show you in a minute some of the Bibles we suggest, but you can have that as your personal Bible and go for it. The saints, you know, the communion of saints in heaven. And then we dig into four classes that cover the way we worship in church. It's called the Mass. We're going to go under where that name came from, okay? But here again, there's four classes. First part of the Liturgy of the Word, the Eucharist, and then where is that in the Bible? We have two classes on that. Please, those would be good ones to come to, to read even for Catholics to say, gee, I didn't know, but uh, everything has meaning and everything is based in, in the Bible. And then we take a break for Thanksgiving. And then the big topic, folks, that I hear in the community is Mary. You know, um, many people put Mary out at Christmas, you know, for the little um, uh, crib scene and all that. There's Joseph, Jesus, and Mary, and then quickly put Mary away. But uh, we don't. We think that Mary is so special to God. And so she's very special to us, handpicked to be the mother of the savior of the world. And uh, she's a creature, a perfect creature, but she's a creature. We don't worship Mary. We love her. We, you know, uh, sing her praises and all of that, but she is not God. We Catholics, we worship God alone. God is the creator and everything else is created. And so God, we, we worship the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But we're going to spend a class to give you a little deeper understanding of our, our love for Mary and our, our, our um, praise for Mary. And so then we have the opportunity to go to Mass. It's a, uh, at the, it's a great feast day. And maybe you can come. That'd be great. And then I think we have the tour of the church. And then we break for Christmas. So if that sounds appealing to you good folks, then that's great. That's like in college, you have to have a syllabus and have to have a guide on, on where you're doing. And so that's what we wanted to share with you at that moment there. Any questions so far? There's no test. How about that? <laughs> there's no midterm. There's no final. And uh, you don't have to be worried about that. Okay, great. Thank you. And then uh, please come if you can, 630. And we actually start at 7. You don't have to eat. But if you do want to come and have a little bite to eat or drink, you can do that. And I stay, I live here. So I stay after class too. And if you had questions and say, we could take time and go over them, write them down. Okay. And then the CD recordings are going to be available at the next class. Okay, I don't think I started the CD player. I didn't. I'm going to start it now. Okay, just so we can catch up. Okay. Good. Okay, great. Alrighty. I want to show you some of the tools of the trade. We might have some pictures up here. I want to show you the books that are available uh, to help you through this class, okay? The book that is used all across North America is the New American Bible, NAB. You see the designation NAB. So that's the New American Bible, the Catholic Answer Bible. I like this book in a special way because uh, the church has put in uh, some questions there that Catholics and non-Catholics may ask about the Catholic Church. In the very front here, I'll just give you an example. There's three pages I have mine highlighted here of sample questions. You know, questions that, you know, why is Mary called the mother of God? Why do Catholics confess to a priest? What is the second coming? What's the rapture? You know, um, what are the sacraments? Are they necessary? The Eucharist, is it truly the body and blood of Jesus? And so if you have these questions, there's 88 questions in here that a non-Catholic or Catholic might ask. And then what you do is you go to the section and... Uh, and it's colored, and it's just one page. So in one page, they're going to answer the question in one page and then give all the citations on where to find it in Scripture. And in this other book I'm going to show you in a minute called The Catechism. So it's really helpful, you know, if you, you can go back and forth and refresh yourself, okay? What does the church teach about divorce? Boom, here's the answer, and then here where it is in the Bible, okay? And then what does the church teach about homosexuality? Here's the question, here's the answer, and then here's where it is in Scripture. And so... This is available, I think if you get the Bible with the tabbies, you know, the tabs for the books of the Bible, it's like $30, I think. But it's money well spent, and, um, you, and uh, we're not making any money. We just want to make it available. If you have your own Bible, and I have mine from seminary, and so mine is all highlighted and organized and everything, and I love this one, okay? And it's thicker because they have 500 pages of commentary that help us through the studies, okay? So it's that thick, but it's then another 500 pages. You'll see me use both. But I, we make the book available, so if you want to buy the Bible or bring your own Bible, that's great. And the other book that we use is the Catechism of the Catholic Church, okay? And that's the compilation of everything that we believe in the area of faith and morals, okay? Uh, 1992 is the latest rendition of this. So we have 300 bishops in America, 
And they all got together and they put together the teachings that we have in all areas, the sacraments, our prayers, and all of that. It's in here. And so we believe everything that's here. Okay, so what a great compilation. It's got a great index. You know, you want to talk about prayer. You want to talk about the mass, whatever, marriage. There's Mary. And it guides you on where to go there. And we're going to refer to this. Okay, this is like a little handbook. It's not a book you read. It's more like an encyclopedia that you use to refresh you and guide you on, on the faith. So those would be the two texts, the catechism of the church and then the Bible and um, that you have as, as resources, okay? All righty. And so um, then we have handouts. We're going to get, you have the notebook and every week we're going to give you a few more handouts and you just put them in there and pretty soon by the time you're all done, you'll have quite a compilation there of information. Uh, we're going to give you a Catholic prayer book as we get closer uh, to the end of our journey. During your life, you have probably received information about the Catholic Church from a number of sources. How many have seen a good representation of the church in movies? Raise your hand. Have you ever done that? I mean, the old movies. I mean, they were really good. The Bells of St. Mary, you know, and uh, the men of, um, uh, what is it called? The men of um, Boys Town. That's a good one. But here again, they put the Catholic priests in a favorable light. This is the 50s and the 60s and all that. And so many people learned about it. And they were good. They were good representations. The media today, you can learn about uh, the Catholic Church on the internet, of course. Just Google anything. Family, friends, co-workers. Some of it's true, but probably some of it is not fully true. Okay? If you want to be clear. So now is your chance to get the straight scoop. We're going to give you the straight scoop. So, and uh, you're in the right place. So what is required for you to get the straight scoop? I'd like to pr propose that you have to have an openness when you come here. You know, you have to be open to maybe change in something that grandma told you. Grandma maybe said that those Catholics, they worship Mary. And it's like, I, I believe grandma was right. Well, you know, if you have new information, then you want to be open to the fact that, well, maybe there's a new twist on that. And maybe you would look at it a different way. What I like, it's called a paradigm shift, which means a radical change in the way you think uh, because you now have new information from a different source. And I'd like to give you two examples of what a paradigm shift can do with regard to uh, your understanding. And so one of them would be, I think we have a picture here. I want you to just imagine, you know, busy downtown Birmingham and there's a guy on the bus and he's riding home and he's trying to read. And then the bus stops and on the bus comes a man and he's got two little children, two little children. So the guy sits on the bus and he's very quiet and the kids are running all around. The kids are making a wreck on the bus. They're running up and down the aisle and they're making a fit tither. And so the guy that was on the bus originally goes up to the guy. He says, uh, have you no clue that your children are running up and down the aisle here and I'm trying to read and it's very annoying. You know, this is very, very annoying. And the guy looks at me and says, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I wasn't thinking I just came from the hospital. My wife just died. How do you think that guy felt? They went up to him and tried to correct him for not correcting his kids. Wow. He thought he had it all figured out. This clown is just letting his kids run wild. He doesn't care. He doesn't care about me trying to read. He doesn't respect me and all that. And so he went up there and the guy, the real reason the guy wasn't tending to his children is because he just left the hospital. His wife just died. Probably in normal situations, he would have had all kinds of say, reprimanding them and everything, but he was kind of like not there. The truth is the man was intensely preoccupied, grieving his wife. So when you realize the truth, it brings a paradigm shift. Once he heard that, he probably started to apologize to the guy. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Forget what I said, you know, and like that. And so he had new information and uh, it can change your way of thinking. I'd like to give you another little example, okay, of how new information can affect the way that we think or look at things, okay? So you have this little um, city alleyway here. And so between these two buildings here, uh, they're about 16 feet apart. And so if there was a way to take a board that's about as wide as your table, 16 feet long, probably these are eight foot, so twice as long as your table, and then lay it between that building and that building. And I were to ask you, you know, I want you to walk on that board from that building to that building. You'd probably say, wow, no problem. And you probably get on the board and walk right across. No big deal, okay? Now, what if we were to raise that board up to the second story window, okay? And I were to ask you, you know, I want you to walk on the board from that window to that window. Any change? Maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit, you know, I don't know about that wind. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if I want to do that, you know. 
But now it's a new situation, okay? You got something else to think about, okay? So now you're up there and you say, hmm, maybe I'm not so anxious to go 16 feet on a three foot wide board to the other building over there, you know? And here's another, more information, you know? Let's say, for example, that uh, you're in this building and your children or your grandchildren are in that building and that building is on fire. New news, okay. What does that do to the way you look at the situation? There's not a parent in here or grandparent that wouldn't be on that board <laughs> going over there to save or to help their children, right? Okay, so you got new information. And if you have new information, they can really change the way you look at things. You might say, oh my gosh, to heck with it. And you're, I'm right over there, okay? Okay. It's the same board. It's the same width. But you look at it differently. Now you don't see the risks and the obstacles. You just say, I'm gone. And I do that, Okay. Our minds assess every situation and we make a decision on how we're going to respond. But as we've just seen, as we get new data, good data, we have the capacity to change the way that we look at things and respond in a different way. It applies to walking on a board and it applies to the way we practice our faith. In sales, we had uh, the best sales people. We read all the books. Earl Nightingale is a great man that wrote much. And he had this to say once about this. He said, we should be ready to throw our most cherished beliefs into the ash can if we can find something that comes closer to the truth. So if we're really searching for truth and then we find something that is more real, then we would let go of something that wasn't serving us and we would embrace something that did. Here's an example, just a little crazy example. My dad taught us when we learned how to drive. He said, always put your hand at the top of the steering wheel. We're 16. We're learning how to drive. He said, when you drive like that, if you ever get in a situation, then you can go either way quickly, you know? And I used that. I mean, growing up, I said, you're driving, you look away and you go, oh, I can get out of the way because you got your hand on the top of the wheel. He said, you don't want your hands down here because if you try to do that, then you wouldn't be able to respond as quickly. Okay. So I'm in Atlanta. I'm with my job with Kodak. I'm in Atlanta and it's very busy, uh, the 285 around Atlanta. And so one day uh, there was a bad accident. And so I look over in the lane next to me and they stopped and then they're all stopped. And I stopped, I didn't get hit or anything, but I looked over and the young lady in the car next to me had crashed into the car in front of her. And she had had her hand at the top of the wheel because she broke her arm and she broke her nose. What happened? Well, she went like this, okay. When, she, when the airbag came out, when the airbag came out, it pushed her arm that was up here right in broken nose. I went over there. It was the start of cell phones and all that. And we called for help and all, but I made the decision at that moment <laughs> that I'm never driving with my hand at the top of the wheel again. They didn't have airbags when I was driving, you know, when, when they had told me to put it up there, there was a rigid steering wheel. But now if you're in an, if you have their foot on the brake and you hit something in an instant, that airbag comes out and it can move your arm as a weapon now right in your face. And so now I drive like this, it's like 45. It's not like this, but like this. And if the airbag comes out, then, then you're pretty safe. But that's just a little example, just a little example of, um, you know, like Earl Nightingale says, I had this belief, this is right, dad said it, that's the way to drive, but maybe with new information, that's not the way to drive, okay? And so we want to keep looking for the truth. You know, many people make decisions on what grandma said, or what the guys or girls said at work, you know, you ask people, what do you think, you know, what do you think? What we read in the newspaper is important, what we find on the internet, and you may get some truth in all of that, some truth. But it is good to go to the source. And so I'm glad you're here tonight. Come to the church and we'll do the very best we can. You consider me a trained representative. And I'm going to give you the, everything I know about God and the church and the purpose in life. Okay. And um, your presence shows that you're open. So I want to thank you for that, that you're open to all this. Okay. Like walking that 16 foot board, I invite you to push aside the obstacles that may be in the way. You may have to change your schedule. There's no homework really, but you may have to change your schedule and, and, and come and continue to come. And if you can't come, then you can always get on the YouTube, the Facebook, or um, anytime you want to see it because we're going to record them. But I do think there's a specialness if you can't come. I mean, um, just like in church, the people that are not in church, there's the specialness that they're missing by not being in church, even though they're watching it. And then you get to decide. You get to decide, okay? So let's begin with some definitions, folks. Let's go over a few definitions and you don't have to write them down. Me, I'm always writing things down. But if you want to write, you have some notes in there. I, do we have notebook paper there, Lori? Do we put any in or is it just, not that we need it, but some of your sheets you can write on the back or whatever if you want to take down something. Let's take a peek. Uh, Ryan, what's our first one? What is religion? Good. Just some definitions to, to begin. 
if you choose. You know, I think we have pens and highlighters and all of that to offer. Religion is a personal or institutionalized system grounded in the belief in and the reverence for a supernatural power. That there is something supernatural. You know, our good people that are in AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, I offered the uh, people to use the church I was in, St. Uh, Elizabeth Ann Seton, for 10 years, of my 12 years there. They came every Tuesday and Friday. And what's one of the first things they learn is their belief in a higher power, okay? That there is something outside of us that is way over us. And so religion would be the system grounded in the belief in or the reverence for a supernatural power, a creator or governor of the universe, okay? Please, let's take a look at theology now. That's religion, okay? Theology. Theo is God. Theology is the science of, like biology, and, you know, that's the study of or the science of God. And so what is theology? The study of the nature of God and religious truth. The, def the definition I like the most is uh, a great saint of the church, St. Alphonsus Liguori. He says it's as simple as faith seeking understanding. Because I bet many in this room, we believe that there's an unseen God. There is a God. I mean, we're going to talk about that in depth in a minute, but... If you have faith that there is a God, then you have this hunger and thirst to kind of know more. So tell me more. I want to know that God. I want to know him. So you're seeking to understand him. And so theology, the science of God, the study of God, is faith seeking understanding. Okay. And the next one, we're just going to make the distinction. You'll hear these two words a lot. Uh, atheist, you know. An atheist Remember, if Theo is God, then theist is a believer in God. Atheist is a person who does not believe in God. That's where the word atheist comes from, atheist. And the agnostic, Gnosticism is knowledge. The Gnostics thought they knew it all. Okay, agnostic means it's impossible to know if God exists, if a person says I'm agnostic. So they're not definitively saying there is no God. They're just saying if there is, I can't prove it or I don't care or something like that. So it's like, okay, but I can't, you can't know God. That's what they're saying, okay? And so let's take a look at the next one. If we okay, we're going to pause on that. But is there a God? Oh, God. Okay, so take a peek if you would. There's a lot there, folks, but I just want to show you where it is, okay? Five proofs of the existence of God, and that's from St. Thomas Aquinas. 74, about 50 years, that young man, but he is the one that did the synthesis, you know, between um, philosophy and theology, and a great leader of the church. I mean, he was instrumental in bringing the Summa Theologica, and uh, he has five proofs. Now, this is a long time ago, 12, that's 800 years ago, 1200, and there are many, many, many proofs today that are very modern, very scientific, that there is a God, many. And uh, we had the priest from California uh, come in and give us a lecture, and he is immersed. He's a physicist, and uh, you know. But here, what did Saint Thomas say? You know, on the bottom I summarize. So Saint Thomas Aquinas has demonstrated. Okay, there had to be a first move. I mean, just science says there had to be a first move, uh, and that that's the understanding of God, the efficient cause the absolute necessity, the ultimate source, and the intelligent governor of the world. And so for your, your review, you can take a peek at that, and I can guide you to even more modern-day scientific uh, depictions that there is the existence of God. Okay. What is faith? People say, you have the faith, or I have faith. What would you say is faith? The faith, the, the one great definition I like is faith is our free response to God. Okay. He said, here it is. And when we accept that and when we embrace that, that was called faith. Faith is our free response to God who always acts first. Okay. That's faith. How does God reveal himself to us? How does God make himself known to us? How can we come to know God? And so here's how God reveals himself to us. And you might not have thought of this. Okay. Uh, before, but the created world, you know, um, all the people through time, they didn't know what we know today. I mean, even before Jesus, before the New Testament and all that, they didn't have that and they believed. Why? Because of the created world. We're going to look at that in a minute. If you go out now, we just saw a beautiful sunset. 
when I see the sunset, I say, way to go, God. I mean, I didn't do that. Do you know anybody that did that? I don't know anybody that did that. I love the moon rise. When I go down to the beach there and I see the moon come up and it's red as it breaks their horizon and then it turns white as it gets up higher. And I say, way to go, God. There is such harmony and symphony and just wonder and awe and expansiveness. Like, I didn't do that. And I don't know anybody that did. And so it's just like, wow, that is so great. If you look at the created world and you see that order, this is not uh, an accident. This is very much planned, okay? So God reveals himself in the created world and then through divine revelation, okay? So we would say this is divine revelation or part of it. This is part of it, you know, the written word. And then we have... Um, in addition to that. Okay, so let's take a peek of those a little different. That's how God reveals himself to us. Let's explore that through the created world, okay? So we have a visible universe out there. Um, there is a great DVD, if you get it. I put the three-page summary. I did this little summary of this DVD. So when you get the part that called the heavens declare, that's actually, he took that from Psalm 19, and the title. But this author, Dr. James Mullaney, he did a beautiful job. It's not long, but it just makes you wonder uh, about how, how wonderful God is, okay? So I'm just going to talk a little bit about that. I have some stats here. You have the same thing in front of you, okay? So if you get the little book called Stars and you look up at heavenly bodies, even without a telescope, you can see a lot and learn a lot, okay? And he, he just reviews, what is a light year, okay? A light year is the distance light will travel in a year. How fast is it going? 186,000 miles a second. That means it's traveling around the world seven times in a second. <laughs> I don't know about you, but when I hear that kind of data, it kind of dwarfs the mind. Seven times around the world in a second. That's the speed of light. And so the distance to the edge of the observable universe is 15 billion light years. That's 6 trillion miles times 15 billion is a big, big, big number. Okay. Okay. If you read down your sheet there, what amazes me is at the bottom there, okay, we're on Earth, and you could say that we're on a moving spaceship, spaceship Earth. Why? Okay, the Earth is rotating on an axis, and it's spinning at the rate of 800 miles an hour. And as it's spinning, it's moving around the sun. So it's spinning on an axis, it's moving around the sun, and that's at 66,000 miles an hour. It's moving around the sun, okay? And we're in the solar system. The sun is the center of the Milky Way galaxy. So you've got the world, I mean, the earth is turning, it's moving around the sun, and then the whole galaxy is moving. The whole galaxy is moving at 500,000 miles an hour. That's where it's moving, okay? Where's it going? <laughs> Where's it going? And that's just one galaxy. And the next closest galaxy is the Andromeda galaxy. It has 500,000 suns. <laughs> I mean, when you hear data like that, and this is, this is science, you know, they've explored there, and it's like, you're telling me that this is the result of the Big Bang, right? You're telling me that that order and that structure with the seasons and the balance and earthly life, it's just, there's no question in my mind, okay? It tells how hot the sun is, how long the sun's been burning, next page, page two, you know, four and a half billion years, four and a half billion years, the sun has been um, burning, and they say it's got... Um, one half to 90% of the star is still left, okay? And um, how many of you have seen the movie called God's Not Dead? Raise your hand if you have seen that movie, God's Not Dead, beautiful. For those of you that haven't, you ought to check it out. The guy's instructing the class, I think it's like 60 students at the university level, and he wants to use all of his um, resources there are atheistic professors that he's going to use. And so he says, take this sheet of paper and sign there is no God and pass it down and pass it in. And when everybody agrees there's no God, we'll begin our class. And there's one Christian kid in the class. And he says, no, I, I am not going to sign that. He says, okay, Smarty, you have three classes, 10 minutes in each of the next three classes to show us, you know, how creation started. And he does a marvelous job. And so, I mean, it's really worth seeing, you know, because uh, what we believe is God said, let there be light. God is light. He said, let there be light. And it was done. That's what we believe. And so I, it's just it's great. So from the created universe, what we're saying there is that, um, and another amazing thing, on page three at the bottom, the largest known unit in nature is a galaxy. The smallest unit is the atom. 
And we human beings are exactly halfway between an atom and a galaxy. We're as much bigger than an atom as a galaxy is bigger than us. And this man looks at it. God placed us midway in his creation between the ultra small and the ultra large so that he could admire all of his handiwork. What beautiful words. Could it be true? Wow. We're halfway between an, an atom and a galaxy. Wow. Okay. So when you see the vastness and the harmony, the beauty, rhythm, order, and power at the, mic, at the macro level and the micro level, you know, the atom, and you have a nucleus with uh, protons, neutrons, and then the electrons, and it's like, really? How did that happen, you know? How did it happen that we can love one another? That happened from an explosion? Really? It's like, wow. Well, and so when you start looking at all of that, you say, there must be a creator. There must be. And now we're going to look at divine revelation where God tells us, he says, yeah, I created it all. And so if you really didn't get it yet, I'm going to tell you in writing. So we'll look at through divine revelation. And we'd like to say there's two fonts to that divine revelation. One is sacred scripture. That's the written word of God. And the other aspect, the other font of divine revelation is the oral truth about God. We're going to look at that in a little more depth in a minute, but let's look at sacred scripture for just a moment. Okay. So if we really don't know if there's a God and we said, this could be his book, you know, 73 books, Old Testament and new 46 and 27. Let's take a look. Isaiah, he's a prophet. Um, you know, so he's like 600 years before Jesus. And so I am the Lord. This is what God speaks through the prophet. God says, I am the Lord. There is no other. There is no God besides me. It is I who arm you, though you do not know me. I form the light and create the darkness. I make well and create woe. I, the Lord, do all these things. So the written word of God lets us know that there is a God. Let's please go to the next one there, Ryan. It was I who made the earth and created the people upon it. It was my hands that stretched out the heavens. I gave the order to all their host. Isaiah 45. And we look further. For thus says the Lord, the creator of the heavens, the designer and maker of the earth, who established it, not as an empty waste did he create it, but designing it to be lived in. I am the Lord, there is no other. The words of scripture. And when we use those words about design, to see the perfect, the perfect design, the harmony that is in nature and in creation, then that's, that's what it is right there. I think there might be one more, if that, that's 18. So let's look at a little different place in scripture. Okay, here's Isaiah 66. For thus says the Lord, the heavens are my throne, the earth my footstool. What house can you build for me? Where is the place of my rest? My hand made all these things when all of them came to be, oracle of the Lord. This is the one whom I approve, the afflicted one, crushed in spirit, who trembles at my word. And so creation and scripture are one, okay? Uh, they're united. God can reveal himself to us in both ways. And then let's see if there's another one there first. That's the end of uh, sacred scripture, okay? Now we're going to look at sacred tradition, okay? I had a great grandpa. He lived to be 93, my mom's dad, my other grandpa, 96. And we had a heck of a time. We'd go over there most every other week. Mom and dad would take us kids. We'd see our cousins and all that over there. And grandpa loved us a lot. Man, he never, ever wrote me anything. He never put a postcard or anything. And so my memories of him were everything that I can remember about him, how he took us in the basement and we shot pool. I mean, he told us stories about the stockyards, how he grew up and everything. And he never wrote anything down, okay? And so a lot of what I know, the truth of what I know about my grandpa is what has been handed on to me from my godmother, my mom, and um, from what I learned from him directly. And we would call that sacred tradition, you know? It isn't the written word of my grandpa. He never wrote anything, okay? But here again, it is sacred to me and it's very special. And so we're going to look now how in Scripture, the New Testament, how uh, we're being in encouraged to remember the things that were preached to us and not just that they were written down. So this is St. Paul. He's writing to the church in Corinth, and he's writing in the year around 53. Our Lord died in 33, and he's writing his letter to the Corinthians around 53. And the first gospel was not written until 65. So before the real gospel... Uh, was written. Um, you know, Mark wrote first, and then you have uh, Matthew and Luke, and they wrote about in the 80s, 85 and 87, and then you have John wrote around 100. So this is well before 
uh, the word gospel, which means good news, the realm before the gospel was written. So Paul is telling, now I'm reminding you brothers of the gospel that I preached to you, which you indeed received and in which you also stand. And so Paul is telling the people that uh, the truth of who God is and what our purpose in life is and all that is being relayed to you by word of mouth. Remember, Paul had the vision of Jesus. He was not an apostle that lived with him, but he had the, the vision of Jesus, and it moved him for 25 years to go and spread the good news of Jesus Christ. And so he preached every day. And he says, now I'm reminding you of the gospel I preached to you and in which you received it. Please, let's look at the next one there, Ryan. Okay. Now, in 2 Thessalonians, Paul wrote that too. He says, brothers, stand firm and hold fast to the traditions that you were taught either by an oral statement or by a letter of ours, okay? So there are teachings that came to us that aren't written down in the book. The canon was closed like in the year 300. The last writing was 100 when John wrote Book of Revelation and the three letters of John in John's Gospel. And so there is tradition that we embrace and that we reference to this day, either by an oral statement or by a letter of ours. That's what Paul is telling them to believe both, okay? And I think there's... Uh, Two more. If we go to the end of John's gospel, there's really two endings. You know, he has chapter 20, he ends, and then he has chapter 21, we believe was added after he died by his disciples. But in John 20, here's how it ends. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book, okay? So is there more? Yeah, there's more. They admitted it at the end of the gospel of John. And then we go to John 21, where the disciples wrote, there are also many other things that Jesus did. But if these were to be described individually, I do not think the whole world could contain the books that would be written. So the reference is the fact that there is more, more that Jesus did, more that Jesus taught that really isn't written in here, but we never have the space because the books uh, could not contain them, okay? And they both flow from the same font. You have a little fountain and you have divine scripture and divine tradition. And so they're all consistent. And so we say there are two founts from the same source, okay? Beautiful. And now we're going to talk about um, our purpose, okay? Let me see. I got uh, catechism again. It's worded so beautifully. At the very beginning of this, uh, there's a little note uh, from the Pope. And here's, here's just a little entry into the catechism. It's about our purpose, okay? God, infinitely perfect and blessed in himself, in a plan of sheer goodness, freely created man, to make him share in his own blessed life. For this reason, at every time and in every place, God draws close to man. He calls man to seek him, to know him, to love him with all his strength. He calls together all men, scattered and divided by sin, into the unity of his family, the church. Wow. I mean, we were taught this in like second grade when we went to school. Why did God make us? God made us to know him to love him and to serve him in this life so that we can merit to be with him in eternal life. That's what, that's what our purpose is. It can be that simple. You know, we can't earn heaven. There's no, if I went to mass every day, I prayed a rosary every day, I can't earn heaven. I can't earn it. We use the word merit heaven, okay? We prepare ourselves to receive the gift. He gives us the gift. If I want to give you, uh, you know, $100 each or something like that, uh, you can't earn this because that's a gift. I want you to have this, okay? But what you did is you predisposed yourself to receive the gift, okay? So if you do what he asks you to do, if you live in the state of grace, if you love one another and you forgive your enemies and all this, then you're ready to receive the gift. That's, it's a beautiful thing, okay? And so God created us. All of us have the same purpose. Our purpose is to know him, love him, and serve him in this life. How do we serve him? Well, we serve him by loving our neighbors, okay? We, we show the way we serve him. He said, you know, Whatever you do to the least of my people, you do to me. So when we treat others with kindness, care, and love, we're actually doing that to Jesus. And so it's beautiful. But I like, as far as purpose, if we break into that for just a moment, I think that that's a, a beautiful thing. So what is our purpose? Okay. And that's the first part. God's design, when we have this, the Catholic Church, the word Catholic that you're some of you are part of, and some are you exploring. The word Catholic means what? Who can tell me what the word Catholic means? Gary? Universal. universal. Okay. The word Catholic means uni, means one, universal. Universal. Very good. And so 
it really came to be in the year 107, okay? Uh, you figure our Lord died in 33, and he had all the ones that followed him. They didn't know what to call themselves, you know? And so they called themselves, it's, we're going to go through this in Acts of the Apostles, but the followers of Jesus called themselves followers of the way. Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so when Jesus died and rose from the dead and went to, back to the Father, they told the people, we're followers of the way. And then at Antioch, they took the name of his title. Remember, Jesus is the Christ. That's not his name. It's the title. He is Jesus, which means God saves. That's his name. And his title is Christos, Christ, which means he is the anointed Messiah. He is the long-awaited Messiah. And so then the followers would take his title and were Christians. His title is Christ. Our title is Christians. And that was at Antioch. There was another great saint and bishop of the church, St. Ignatius of Antioch who did great things. And you know, there was great persecution in the early years of the church. And so the, um, the leader of that area in Antioch, they took uh, St. Ignatius, we call him Saint now, and they took him to Rome and threw him to the lions. They did that a lot. They would either crucify uh, the Christians or they would throw them in the Colosseum to the lions. And as they were taking him to the Colosseum, he wrote seven letters to the other churches, you know, like the ones there. Um, that were already established, like in Corinth and so forth. And we have those letters that he wrote. And in one letter um, to the church in Smyrna, he says that wherever Jesus Christ is, there is the Catholic Church. Wow. Wherever Jesus Christ is, there is the Catholic Church. And it's the first time that the church was called Catholic. And it was so embracing, you know, because as it says, it's universal. One father, one family. Jesus said in Matthew, he started one church, he wanted us all to be together in one church. And so that's the one. We have one unbegotten God, one only begotten Son, one holy Catholic Church. And so that, that oneness just permeates all of God. And so when you hear the word Catholic, it means worldwide or it means universal. And it's by God's design. It, it came really early. 107 was the year uh, where that began to be used to uh, describe uh, the church that Jesus started. Okay, what's next, please, there, uh, Ryan? Okay, before we do that, we're almost at the end, folks. Right at 8 o'clock. Don't look at the clock, but we're pretty close to 8 o'clock, okay? We want to keep our promise, okay? I remember that some people in my former parish over there, uh, they had two foster kids. Sean Holly had two foster kids, and um, they asked their foster parents, there, are we Catholic or Christian? <laughs> and so it's like, oh, boy. You know, the first Christians were Catholic. All Christians until the year 1517. If you were Christian, you were Catholic because that was the, the grouping of people. And then there was the start of the Protestant Reformation with Martin Luther, a Catholic priest just like me, who turned away from his promises. You know, he got married and he started to embrace other things and all that. And it's sort of like, ooh. And so that, that started the Protestant Reformation. But for 1500 years, if you were Christian, you were Catholic. And so for these little kids, there's some can be confusing. Are we Christian or Catholics? Well, Catholics were the first Christians, okay? We, we follow Jesus Christ. And so the Catholic Church is the church he started. And so the answer to those children would be, yeah, uh, we are Catholic and we are Christian, okay? And then another uh, person of mine, they had two uh, grandchildren, and they asked the question, are Catholics Christians? And so there can be a lot of confusion, you know, are Catholics Christians, you know? And we are. <laughs> we're the first Christians, and we've perdured for uh, 2,000 years. And so... Be, be, be assured of that. And so I do want to thank you for coming. We're going to close with a little snippet about the Catholic Church. Is, uh, such good videos out and everything. It's just three minutes, and we're going to put that together. But the, any questions before we close? Anything at all? Okay. Okay, great. Again, thank you for coming. And I'm here afterward. We'll, we'll greet you as you leave and all that. And so uh, we're going to put on a little video here. I'll dim the lights. And then um, we'll have a, a closing prayer at the... Um, Let's have a closing prayer now, and then we'll just show the video and be a little easier then. So we're going to have a little prayer. It's called the Glory Be. There is a Gloria that we say at church on Sunday. It's a beautiful prayer of praise, but we abbreviate that for a little situations like this. We're just going to just praise it. And so in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. 
May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much. Please stay seated and we'll turn on the video and enjoy. Our family has spanned the centuries and the globe. With God's grace, we started hospitals to care for the sick. We established orphanages and helped the poor. We are the largest charitable organization on the planet, bringing comfort to those in need. We educate more children than any other institution. We developed the scientific method and founded the college system. We defend the dignity of human life and uphold marriage. Guided by the Holy Spirit, we compiled the Bible. We are transformed by sacred scripture and sacred tradition, which have guided us for 2,000 years. We are the Catholic Church, with over 1 billion in our family, sharing in the sacraments and fullness of the Christian faith. Jesus started our church when he said to Peter, the first pope, you are rock, and upon this rock I will build my church. So if you've been away from the Catholic Church, we invite you to take another look. Visit catholicscomehome.org today. We are Catholic. Welcome home. And, uh, I'm Father Deering to introduce, there are a few new people here, so introduce myself to you. I've been in this particular parish, as we say, this particular church for four years. I was ordained in 2002, and I've been a priest now for 18 years, okay? You go through some study, five years of prayer and study, and called the seminary, where you're formed in the truth of the church, and then the bishop ordains you and pours forth holy orders, and then you go out to serve the people. So it's a real joy being here four years, and the people here in Tuscaloosa have welcomed me. I'm an Auburn graduate, <laughs> and I'm here in uh, Tuscaloosa, and uh, I've been greatly welcomed, and the people here are great. So I just love being here and uh, hope to stay a while. We usually stay 6 to 12 years in a certain church unless something changes, okay? So welcome back, and I want to just go over a little ditty here to begin with. In our, par in our diocese here, we have a newspaper that comes out once a week, and it's usually about 8 pages or 12, and uh, it, does a it does really good things. And so you can get it delivered to your door. And inside it talks a little bit about our Holy Father. There's always something about the Pope. What is he talking about? His teachings and so forth. Uh, and then there's something usually about our Bishop. Here's our Bishop, Bishop Stephen Reka. And he had a great mass to welcome back all the teachers and look, learn, and live and love. And that's the theme for this year. And there's usually some pictures about parish life. And sometimes we're in the paper if our kids did something in the school or whatever. So this would be something to look forward to. And in the issue that was right before this issue, September 11th, there was a uh, little article that I copied because I thought it was very good. So if you'll take that one I handed out to you, I just want to look at it for a minute. If you didn't get one, I'll get you guys one here. Take a peek at that. It was an extra handout. Okay, sure. And I got some more copies over here, I think. Did that get it to Lori? Was that only online? Uh, it did not make it. It did not make it. So we'll talk about this handout just for a second. You remember last week, for those of you who were here last week, we talked about many things. And we did talk about why are we here? What's our purpose? What's God's plan and all this? And this article showed up and the great author, Dr. David Anders at uh, Downtown Diocese. And he talked about mysticism. So we may wonder, what is that? So it's part of the Catholic tradition, this idea of mysticism. And just a few of the highlights there. Um, mysticism is at the heart of the Catholic faith. And true mysticism simply means that we live profoundly by God, having tasted and seen that the Lord is good, okay? And so there's some examples here. That picture here that's so beautiful, that's St. Augustine. He lived in the fourth century, and uh, he was a pretty wayward soul and went through a great conversion experience, and he became a shepherd of the church. He was a bishop, and he uh, wrote many works. We have uh, so many of his written works. He wrote books and we call him a doctor of the church. So profound was his teaching. And uh, he's holding a heart there that's on fire. And up in the cloud, it didn't copy too good, but it says veritas, and that means truth. So it's an image of him. He's got the quill. He's a writer and a preacher. But it's, you know, he had this saying. He said, our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. Did you ever hear that? Our heart, there's a great movie out. Actually, it's called Restless Heart. And it's a, uh, it's a movie about him. And it's a beautiful movie to see, Restless Heart. But he said that, and it's true. You know, God has made us. He's created us for himself. And he's kind of hardwired us to be restless. I mean, we want this, we want this, we want this. But we will be restless until we rest in him, who is eternal peace, who is truth. And we're all looking for the truth. So, I mean, this article I thought was really good to go over some of the things. There's so much here. I won't belabor it, but um, we are all called to a mystical life. Um, 
and um, so that's part of it here, you know, to, to seek God and to know God and love God in this life so we're with them in eternity. So I'll set that aside and we'll look at another article that I handed out to you folks before we really begin. We always begin with a prayer, but just a little background here, and that would be um, this one. It says, the sign of the cross for Protestants. That may be one of your top ones. If you just take a peek at that for a second. Very good. I, I keep this article. which came out in 2009. And uh, I thought it was very interesting. It says a Methodist scholar uh, at the Samford University in Birmingham, uh, he said that uh, Protestants trying to use the sign of the cross as a reminder of Jesus' sacrifice for mankind's salvation. Folks, you know, we Catholics, many times we bookend our prayers. We begin and we end our prayers by making the sign of the cross. What is that? Well, sometimes I take the big cross off the wall and lay it on me. So that would be the main beam and the cross beam of the cross of Christ. And so from our earliest age, we teach our children. I can remember mom saying, you know, touch your forehead, touch your tummy, touch your shoulder, and touch your shoulder. And what you're doing is you're tracing out the main beam and the cross beam, which is the sign of the cross. You may know in the Crusades, when they went into battle, they had the red cross on their scapular, and they went in there carrying the cross of Christ on over their heart. And how were we saved? How do we believe we're saved? We're saved by the cross of Christ. If he hadn't done that, you know, put himself on the altar of the cross and offered himself to the Father, uh, we'd still be enslaved to sin. We still have the gates of heaven closed and all that. So how are we saved? By the cross of Christ. And so here, the Protestants are saying, well, it's a perpetual reminder. I highlighted a few things there, that our lives are shaped by the cross. Protestants revolted against many traditional rituals that Catholics used at the time of the Reformation. So folks, that's 500 years ago. In 1517 was the beginning of what's called the Protestant Reformation. And he says, I think it's an anti-Catholic reaction and it's time to get over it. There's a danger of it becoming rote. You know, there are Catholics that do this and, 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 and they just, it's so rote, it's so in, ingrained that they don't know what they're doing, okay? But if you do trace out the sign of the cross and you call God by name, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, it really means something. God has revealed himself to us as Trinity, three and one. And so when we do that, it's a very reverential way to enter into this conversation with God that we call prayer. And it's a very reverential way to end your prayer. We have many of our Hispanic brothers and sisters in this parish. And when you see them do it, they really mean it. I mean, first of all, they make the sign of the cross with their index finger and their thumb, okay? And then they do this, they cross their mind and they cross their lips and they cross their heart. And then they do a big cross and then they kiss the cross. So what they're saying is, God, be in my mind, on my lips, in my heart, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And it really means something. Does that, doesn't that touch you? When I see them do it, I think it's like, whoa, that is very, very touching. And so it, you can really, in your mind, you say, God, be in my mind, heart, and in, uh, on my lips. And so at the end of their thing that says the former Baptist minister, Michael Wilson, led the interdenominational group in prayer, and they began with the sign of the cross. So you don't have to do that. I mean, you're here and you're visiting and you're exploring the Catholic Church, and but we, I want to explain why we do it. And if you want to adopt that, that's beautiful. It's just the sign of our salvation in Jesus Christ, okay? So we're going to discuss some important issues tonight. And does the schedule come later there, Ryan? Okay, so we'll do that. So I'd like to do this. I'm going to start our CD player and we record this audibly. And there are people that get the CDs and they put them in their car while they're driving. And you can listen to the audible side of this presentation without the video. So I'll start that and then we'll have our opening prayer and then we'll begin. Okay, so let's do that. Okay, and we can begin, if you choose, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we praise you for the wonder of creation and for your revealed word. We thank you for the gift of our faith that brings us together once again. May we never take our faith for granted. Please deepen our faith by raising our understanding. Please bless all those visiting us tonight. Open their ears to hear your word and their hearts to receive your spirit. Fill them with the knowledge that they seek so they fall deeper in love with you. 
We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. So beautiful. Okay. What's our first backup here as we review, please, there, Ryan? We'll look, we'll look at the schedule. Let's take a peek at our schedule. It's a, there are some UA students here, and you know the first day the professor gives you a little syllabus. You know, what is the course plan for the year? And so we've kind of mapped that out. If you count them, it's right about 25 classes. And so that's our class schedule. So we're at September 22. We're going to talk about two dimensions, the Bible and the catechism. That may be new to some people. Everybody's coming from a different um, faith history. And so... Big one next week, big one. I mean, here in the South, we are in the South, and a big question that people ask one another is, are you saved? Are you saved? Okay. And we Catholics, we know the answer, but sometimes we get tongue-tied on how to express that with other people. So we're going to really break that open next week. So that's the, the course topic. And so please come. Um, then another important dimension of what the Catholics believe is marriage, divorce, and this word you may have never heard, annulment. Okay. And so... God says God brings together a man and the woman and his desire is that they be one forever. That's actually what they say at the altar. I will love you and honor you. How long? All the days of my life. But sad but true, in our community, there are marriages that break apart and there's divorce. And so then there's this aspect of annulment. You know, are we going to look and see if it was spiritually invalid or not? And we're going to explore what the Catholic Church does in those situations of divorce. Then we're going to talk about the realities of heaven, hell, and purgatory. It's all through the Bible, all through the Bible. When this body dies, we have a soul that is immortal. You know, all living things have a soul. So your cat has a soul and your dog has a soul. And when they die, their soul dies. It's a mortal soul. But God created us in his image and likeness, and we have an immortal soul. He lives forever, and we will live forever. Where are we going to go? Okay, so we can go one of three places. We can either be with him forever in love in heaven, or we can go into eternal separation from love and punishment, or we can go into this place called pur purgatory. It's, an, it's a place of purification. You know, and If any of us were to die right now, if a jumbo jet came down and we all died together, who could say they'd go right to heaven to be with God who is all holy? Is anyone in this room all holy? No. We have self-love. We have selfishness. We have things on our heart that are unkind and all this and that. But God in his love, if we haven't broken our relationship with him through grave sin, he says, I'm going to purify you so that you can now be with me, who is all love. God is pure. Scripture says nothing unholy will enter the kingdom of God. And so thank goodness. And so in our Protestant brothers and sisters, they may not have heard of purgatory, but it's there. And we'll show you where it is in the Bible and why we think it's a great grace of God. We believe in the saints in heaven. You know, we believe that we're called the church militant. We're alive and we're marching toward the kingdom. Then we have the church purified, those souls that are being purified in eternity. And then we have the church triumphant, which are the, uh, the souls that are in heaven. Those saints like St. Augustine I talked about, he's there. We call him saint. That means holy. That means uh, he's in heaven. Okay. Then we're going to talk about the way we worship. So we gather together every day and there are people in this room that come every day. And so we spend a half hour giving praise and thanks to God. We say sorry for our sins. And then we ask him to help us in our life with our families, with our work and everything. So we do many things at daily mass. And so what is that? How do we do that? We're going to have four classes, the liturgy of the word, where we talk about God instructing us in his word. We're going to have the liturgy of the Eucharist, how he feeds us with himself, with the bread of life. And then we're going to go, where is that in the Bible? Class number November 10, part one, and then... Where is it in the Bible? Because many of our Protestant brothers and sisters, when they see something that we do and they don't understand, they say, where is that in the Bible? It's a good question. It's a very good question. And everything that we do comes from the Bible. Okay, so throughout history, we can go back and every one of those aspects, and we're going to take the time and show where all the dimensions of the Mass are in the Bible. So it gives great credence to the fact for what we do. Okay, we didn't make it up. We're doing what our God said to do little break and then we go into many other topics so we're not going to go over, over them all and you have a list in your first page of your booklet and so to see what is the course plan and the sequence that we're going to follow okay so please the next one there ryan okay and we do have this little blue box right on the table there and at any time if you have a question you can raise your hand and if we have time we'll try to answer it if not just write it down on a piece of paper let it leave it in the blue question box there and then next time as we start class i'll try to answer the question 
and uh, we'll do it that way. So you can answer, you can write it anonymously or you can answer it or write it down with your name on it. Okay, and uh, the next, uh, next slide here. This is the handout. We just looked at this one, the sign of the cross for Protestants, but a good comment was made last week, you know, for those that are on uh, virtual and they're uh, zooming in, could, where could we get copies of the uh, handouts? Like we handed them to you, hard copy. And so what we did, thanks to Lori, she put them on our website and then anybody that's remote or you later can always look them up, get on our website and go through a sequ sequence of things here. That's our website. So if you go on Holy Spirit Catholic Church, Tuscaloosa, that's the slide you'll see. And there's many uh, chiclets there on which way you can go. And so I think Ryan will show us if we go into ministries and then we go down to uh, uh, education and then we come over to uh, the one next to education. We're going to go to the right of Christian initiation and that's... Um, handouts right there. Okay. So if you were to click on that, you'd have all the handouts that you have for another person or to maybe you um, want to see them again. And the people that are on our virtual, uh, you can do that on their computer and print them out. And then you can be looking at the same thing that we're looking at. Is that true? Is that right? Is that about it? Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. So great. Thanks for making that available. It makes every bit of sense that here's like a, a, what's on there right now from last week. They had uh, the three or four handouts from last week. And then the uh, five handouts for this week and that's how we're going to organize it so you can always always go back to them thank you okay and then our next one there please ryan i think we're going to talk about the um, review of the last class is that where we'll go or do we talk about the books i forget okay review of the last class okay I don't know when you go take your courses at the UA. I was like a professor that would back up just a little bit, you know, and then give you a, a running start because some people weren't here. But last week we talked about God and creation and we talked about, you know, how does God reveal himself to us? How does he, big picture, how does he do that? And so let's take a little look and, and talk about a few things, okay? So God reveals himself to us in two ways. You, know, you don't have to, and all through the ages there, they didn't have, many people didn't have the Bible. They didn't have, you know, the level of, contact and experience that we have but if you just go outside like tonight and you look at all that's there in the sky or this morning did you see the sunrise this morning <laughs> i came over for early mass and the way it hit the clouds and everything it was so beautiful it was so beautiful and jeremy knows when i see a sunrise or a sunset i say way to go god <laughs> you know i didn't do that i don't know anybody that did that you did that and so way to go god you and you just look at creation and you know i love moon rises you know when you're down at the beach and you see the moon and as it breaks the horizon it's red and then as it goes up in the atmosphere, it turns white and it's like, oh, and it does that. And it's on a course. I mean, it's like, it's, it's got a trajectory, you know, the, um, the laws of, um, of uh, planet movement and all that. It's not random. It's like organized. And so to look at the created world and see the order and the organization and the immensity of that, there's a way to say that, yeah, I think there must be a God. And what we do is we look at the very big, the macro, and then we look at the very small. We look at the very small. You know, you're telling me that there's uh, electrons going around, a proton and a neutron, and they're whizzing around, and uh, the way you put them together makes elements, and then uh, all of that, and it's like, now, who did that? Who, who designed all of that? And to admit that there is a God, that there's a creature here that can repair themselves, that can procreate themselves, that can think thoughts of love, and it's like, oh, you know, and there's no denying that when you look at all of the different dimensions of reality, just creation, that there is a God, so beautiful. And so the other way would be God wanted to be sure that we knew certain things. And so he revealed himself in divine revelation, godly, holy revelation. And there's two dimensions to that. And one, of course, is the Bible. And if you're coming from the Protestant tradition, you know, uh, the books of the Bible, we, we, we Catholics say there's 46 Old Testament. Our Protestant brothers and sisters go with 39 and then 27 books in the New Testament. And we're both in the same on that 27 books. And we say this is the revealed word of God. Who's the author of the Bible? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit motivated men and women to write down what God wanted written. And there's many authors in here, many. And so we would say under the influence of the Holy Spirit, uh, sacred scripture was written. And the other aspect of that would be sacred tradition. And what we're going to talk about tonight in a special way is the Bible, just at a high level. I mean, the Bible may be new to some of you. How do you look at the Bible? And we're not trying to snow you or impress you. But when you have a high level understanding of what this is, it could be a real tool for you to dig deeper into um, what God wants us to know. So sacred tradition would be the oral aspect and the gleaming 
excuse me, truths that God wanted us to know that have been handed down uh, through the years um, and, not, and some were written down in, in his book. So very good. Please to the next one there, uh, Ryan. Divine revelation through sacred tradition. No, but there are some Protestants that say, this is all I need. I have the Bible and everything I need to know is in the Bible. Well, the Bible doesn't say that. Nowhere in the Bible does it say all you need is the Bible. In fact, the Bible says the opposite. So this is the end of the Gospel of John. When we do that, uh, we say that it's John chapter 20, the 30th verse. And we say, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. So everything that Jesus did and said is not in this book. Why? He said too much. Please go to the next one, John 21. So now we look at the next chapter, John 21, and the way that it ends in verse 25, there are also many other things that Jesus did. But if these were to be described individually, I do not think the whole world could contain the books that would be written. You know, isn't that impressive? <laughs> I mean, it doesn't all fit in 73 books in the Bible. He, there's so much. I mean, they traveled with him three years and the number of miracles and the number of mighty words that he said and mighty deeds that he did. It's like, it's not all in here, okay? And we're going to see why in just a little bit. But that, that, that really impressed me with regard to um, why we say there's more than the Bible, because the Bible says there's more, okay? Okay, let's please look at the next one then, if we could, Ryan. Okay, let's take a look at that handout, folks. I'd love to spend a little moment on that. So there is one that says the New Testament at the top. And I think this is the point where we go over this, okay? Or maybe it's too early. Let me take a peek. Hang on. Yeah, let's look at it now. So let's look at the side where the um, where the numbers are all in order on the right column. It starts at fifty-one. Okay, on the top. On the top, it says fifty-one, and then all the way down to one hundred. Did you get one, sweet? Did you, did you need one of these? You got one? Okay, okay, good. Okay. So on the top, it says the New Testament, and we're gonna, it says on the top, in the order written in time. Oh, they're yellow. You guys have yellow. Very good, very good. Okay, thank you. Let's take a look at that. Okay, what, what, uh, when was Jesus born? What year? Who can tell me? What was the year Jesus was born? What did we tell you in school? Zero, okay. That, so you have the, what's called the, Old Testament, which is, you know, B.C., before Christ, and, and then you have Jesus was born, and then you have A.D., which is Anno Domini, that's Latin for the year of the Lord. So we mark all time, we mark, no matter what you are, Jew or Greek, we mark all time based on the time of Jesus' birth, okay? So we say he was born in the year zero, and then he grew up to be a man, and he went, and at the age of 30, he started to preach and teach, and so he died at the year 33. So if you put that on a timeline in your mind, you know, um, if we said, this is the year zero, okay? And here we are out here in the year 2020, okay? So Jesus came in at the year 30. He's 30 years old. He started to preach and teach. And three years later, they killed him. We killed him, okay? So he died in the year 33, okay? And so if you look at your little list of paper there, when was the New Testament begun to be written, okay? 51, okay? So here we are out here. 51, almost 20 years later, the first letter was written that is one of the 27 letters of the New Testament, 27, okay, okay. So what did the church do? What did all those good people do that loved the Lord and they believed he died and they believe he rose from the dead? What did they do? Well, they told one another about Jesus. I saw him and my friend saw him and he did this miracle and he talked to Peter and all this and that. So for 20, uh, for 20, almost 20 years, let's say 18 years, uh, the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ was talked about uh, verbally. Okay, so this is what we call verbal or oral tradition. Now, when Jesus left, he said, I'm coming back. He did say that. And as time went on, people got to think, oh, maybe he's not coming right back. Maybe we should write some of this down. And so the first to write was St. Paul. And see, it says, Pauline letter to a church. So there was a church that was established in Thessalonica. And so he wrote his first letter to that church in the year 51. It was five chapters long. Okay. And then in the next year, he wrote another letter. So he wrote his second letter to the Thessalonians. 
And then there were other churches. There's one in Galatia, there's one in Philippi, there's one in Corinth, and he wrote to those churches. And so those are the sequential years when he wrote those letters. And then there was an apostolic letter written by the apostle James. One of the apostles was James, and we have his letter. He wrote it in the year 57. And then his pinnacle work, Pauline's, uh, St. Paul's letter to the church in Rome, and it's his longest letter, and so it's her book, and so it's written in the year 58. Then he writes to the church at Ephesus, Colossae, and then he, uh, to Philemon, he wrote, writes to a person, we have that letter, and then St. Peter, the first pope, he writes his first letter, First Peter, and then was the first gospel. Okay, so on our timeline here, you know, 51 is when Paul starts to write. This is the beginning. And then we got out here to 65. And this is the first gospel, okay? And the first one to write is Mark. It's the shortest gospel. But you can see the difference here. Our Lord died in 33. And here we are out here in, let's say, 63. That's 32 years. So 32 years later, we have our first gospel. See, we're living in a day and time where something happens. They have an accident tonight or a football game tonight, and it's in the paper the next day because we record things right away. It's like, wow. But here again, they didn't have the technology and they didn't have the means to do that. And so um, here again, you have a great period of time here where the way the news is passed on before it was written down, the gospel of Mark was by, by oral tradition. Okay, so we got to keep that in mind. Then uh, uh, Paul writes another letter to a person, Timothy. That's a, a priest. And then he writes a second letter in the year 66. And we believe that's when Paul died, okay? They cut off his head, okay? He was sent to uh, prison. And uh, for being a Christian, he was martyred. And he cut off his head. That's why many times you'll see a statue of St. Paul, and he's got the sword. And then the book, because he wrote most of, or almost half of the New Testament, 27 letters. He wrote um, 11 of them, okay? And so he, uh, he wrote 13. He wrote 13 of them. So there you go. And so 65, we believe that Peter and Paul died very close together and they died around the year 65 or 66. And we keep going. There's um, Second Peter, he writes about C68. The timing there, you guys, we believe that they died close together, but in, this, in the mid 60s. And then you have the unknown author for Hebrews and you have the gospel of Luke. So see, Luke was the next one to write a gospel. We have Matthew, Mark, Luke. And he wrote in the year 85. So 20 years later, we have Luke. And then two years later, we have Matthew. And he wrote in 87. Then we believe John was the last to write, and he's out here, we believe, 90 to 90 or to 100. I mean, we say many people say 95 and 100. And that's what we put on there. So John wrote five entries for the Bible. He wrote the three letters. That's the end down there that he wrote in the year 100. He wrote the book of Revelation, apocalyptic writing. We say 95 or the gospel. So, so that would be the order, folks, on that side. Now let's just for a moment, let's turn it to the other side, okay, and see. What the church did in her wisdom, the church put the gospels first. So even though they weren't the first to write, we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and uh, there the gospels are in order. So when you open your Bible, New Testament, you're going to see them in order followed by the Acts of the Apostles. You could say that's the gospel of the Holy Spirit. What did the church do after our Lord did his great work of redemption? And that just documents all of the activities of the church to begin, the beginning church. And then the letters of Paul. See, they're all clustered together there. So you have, when Paul wrote to the churches, it starts with the second column from the right is the number of chapters. So it starts from his longest letter and it goes down to the shortest letter. And then those are letters to churches and then letters to people. And they're in kind of order by the size that they are. And then some other apostolic letters at the bottom there and um, all the way down to Revelation, which ends it in um, different years, but those are the different lengths of it. So just a high level overview of why the Bible is organized the way it is organized, okay? They're clustered together and by the size of, of the documents. Very good. And let's please take a look at the next slide there, if you would. And now our two texts, okay. We'll wait on this. Do we have a picture of this, please, Ryan? Do we have a picture of the um, good deal? Okay. What we're going to spend some time on now is to talk about how this came about, the Bible, and uh, 
what are the different translations and to be ready that there are many translations of the Bible. See, Old Testament, the Bible was written in the, the Hebrew people had a language called Hebrew. Okay, so all of the Old Testament was written in the language called Hebrew. Okay, and then the New Testament, because of the Greek taking over of the area there, we're going to look at Alexander the Great, how he took over before Jesus, and then um, it's written in Greek. So the New Testament is mostly written in Greek, except for one gospel, Matthew, that's written in Aramaic. And that was a language that our Lord spoke, Aramaic, okay? And so we're going to look at translations. You know, how do we get it to be in English? How do we get it to be in German and all of the other languages of the world? And when did that happen? It's very important. And so we're going to offer this Bible here. It's on the back table. I know some of you brought your own Bibles and that's good, but I believe that this is one that NAB means New American Bible, and it's the translation that is used by the Catholic Church all over America, the New American Bible. And so no matter where you go on vacation or where you go to visit, you go to any Catholic Church and they're going to be reading their readings on Sunday every day, every day from the same translation on the New American Bible. And so we're going to use it here so that what you study here and you hear in church is going to be the very same thing, word for word. And the reason I, I like this Bible is because at the very start here inside, it has a section here where it has 88 questions. And so I can just walk over and just show it to some of you. I got mine highlighted with great questions and all that stuff. But if you are a person, even a Catholic or non-Catholic that had questions about anything, you know, they put 88 questions in here that they can help us. Why do Catholics have crucifixes? <clears throat> Was Mary without sin, his mother? You know, is the Eucharist truly the body and blood of Christ? Okay. Is apostolic succession in the Bible? There's 88 different questions. You know, what about the Pope? Why do you confess to a priest? And all of that. And it tells you the page number you would go to. They're in color. So it would say, go to a certain page. Why do Catholics uh, refer to angels and saints? Here's the answer. And then here's where it is in the Bible and the catechism. So you could look at this and refresh yourself. You know, what are indulgences? Is purgatory in the Bible? Here's the answer. And then here is where it is in Holy Scripture. Okay. And so this is available back there. It's $30 with the tabbies that tell you the various books of the Bible. And if you want to get it, fine. We don't make any money on it. We just want to offer it as a tool. If you don't have a Bible, this is a good one. And uh, like I say, um, it's available. So, and then the other book that we're going to use, we're going to talk about in a minute. We'll go through the Bible first, and that's the Catechism. And uh, that's this book here. Is there a picture there, Ryan? Of that? Good. It's a smaller book, and it's uh, a book that is a resource book. You don't read this like a book, you know, from start to finish, but it has a mighty index in it. And if you had any questions at all about priesthood, if you had questions about marriage, you just look it up in the index, and then it goes inside and it gives you the explanation of what Catholics believe. So in the areas of faith and morals, this is what we believe in the Catholic faith. It's all put together in a book. And every Catholic home should have a catechism because as things come up and you just look, what about the sacrament of confirmation? My child's in eighth grade. What is that? You can refresh yourself on the sacrament of confirmation and you know what that is and what are the mentions of marriage and all of that. So I just want to let you know, we're going to talk about that in a minute and it has four parts to it and they're all real important um, prayer and sacraments and, and the moral law. Okay. And let's see what we got here. Okay. The new Catholic uh, uh, answer Bible. And so what I'd like to do on your sheets now, I'm going to refer to more sheets, you guys. First of all, I think this is a good one. Uh, the books in the Bible, you guys have this one. I think it's on white paper. This is another high level look. You can break the books of the Bible apart in many ways. And this is a good way. So, you know, this is one way to do it. The first five are referred to as the Pentateuch. That means five, the first five books written by Moses. And so um, that's the first group always. And then the historical books. What was the, um, the history there of the uh, followers of God, Yahweh, okay? And we have First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, and that's really a history uh, uh, dissertation there. And then the wisdom books. You know, you've heard of the, uh, Job, you've heard of the Psalms, Proverbs, and they're they're grouped that way. They're not in that order. And the Book of Wisdom, okay. And then the prophetic books. You know, we have the three major prophets: Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. The three major prophets, and then the twelve minor prophets. And so that's a way to group it. You know, they're not in order. But here again, that's the way that we group them so you can understand. And then we just talked about the New Testament with the four Gospels. And Acts of the Apostles is like a historical book. And then Paul's letters, they wrote to churches, Paul's letters to people. And then these other um, 
general letters. And so I like this. It's a little overview. But it makes the mystery of 73 books a little less intimidating when you know that they're in different categories. Okay. Now the next handout is a little longer and I think it's on white paper. It's two sided and it looks, it says uh, the origin and the inspiration and the history of the Bible. Okay. If you have your book, another way to look at it would be that's right in here. I copied it from this book. So if you want to highlight it or just use your handout. And folks, we'll move through this pretty quickly because I do want to spend some time on the catechism. But again, if you have questions, just ask them after class. But we, we're trying to be honor your time. We'll try to finish at eight. But this is so good. In, in this particular Bible, if you get this one, this is what they printed. I copied it from here to help you understand the origin and the inspiration of the Bible. Okay. And so I, we'll go with just the highlights there. So on the first page, uh, it says the Bible is unique in that it had God as its author. It's the what we call it, the book of all books, okay? You know, when I was in my 30s, um, I had this feeling, if, if this is the most copied book in the world, if this is the most read book in the world, I'm not gonna live my life and not read it. <laughs> so I started to read it. And I started at the front, I didn't know any better. I started at the front and I started to go right through it. It is not the way to read the Bible. It's very difficult to read it right through like that. There are so many ways we can read it and make it make sense, you know, the journey through the Bible. And there's many videos on it now. But I did work through it. And I think maybe if it's on your heart, if this is truly the book, God's book, if this is written under the Holy Spirit, and this is the book of books, then I want to read it, you know. And we're going to suggest ways to read it. After this, we'll have Bible studies and we'll, we'll break it apart and make it very understandable. But uh, that's what that's referring to, the origin of the Bible. Let's take a look at page two, okay? At the top of page two, if you're with me on that, it says the word Bible. You, are you with me on that? It's in highlight, the word Bible. Let's see, is yours highlighted? Did it come out highlighted? Let's see, very good. It's you right up here. Okay, the word Bible, good, okay. And so it comes from the Greek word biblion, and uh, ta biblia is uh, the plural of books. So it's a book, but it's the compilation of the books. So the word Bible means the books, okay? And then uh, it says the canon, okay? It's not a canon like a military canon. What we do is they used a, a measuring rod that was called the canon. And did it measure up to be the word of God and to be in the book? So it's called the canon of scripture when it talks about the canon. The canon of the Bible contains 73 books, okay, total. 45 of them were written before the time of Christ. 45 are Old Testament, BC, before Christ. And then 27 books come after him. That's New Testament, 27 books after the, the time of Christ, okay? We call it the Old and New Testament, but the uh, Greek word is kaine diatheke, and it means uh, testament or covenant. So we use those words interchangeably, you know, uh, covenant is all over, like 400 times in the Old Testament, the word covenant. And that's a holy, sacred family bond, covenant. You know, and like, and you people that get married, you enter into a covenant when you get married. You say, I am yours and you are mine. And all through Old Testament, God says, I will be your God and you will be my people. And he enters into this holy, sacred covenant. He's made several covenants with man. He had a covenant with Adam and Eve. He had a covenant with Moses. He, we're going to go into this as we get deeper into this. He had a covenant with David. He had the uh, one time, the one time that Jesus referred to the covenant that he established with us, which is the last one, is at the Last Supper. Okay, this is the covenant of my blood when he says that and we say that at every mass so that is the covenant that he established with us in his blood it's the once for all covenant where jesus is saying i am yours and you are mine he did that for us okay and so when we talk what it's saying right here it says the meaning of the word testament when we say new testament in the beginning this was called the new covenant before it was also called the new testament so to understand that okay okay so, okay, you're starting to get the writing. Now, which books go in? So you have all these writings. You have so, we, have the, we have the Gospel of Peter, and we have so many different Gospels that didn't make it into the Bible because the bishops of the church got together, and it's called the Council of Hippo. And so that's on the top of the right-hand column there, the Council of Hippo in the year 400, 393. They first determined which books were inspired and would be included in the canon of the Bible, okay? And then went all the way, to uh, the 1546, which is the Council of Trent, before they finally formally canonized all the books of the Bible. 
So it just there's there's many things that are holy sacred writings that didn't make it into the Bible, but you can be assured that the uh, Bible was put together and um, was, was was compiled by the Catholic Church at the Council of Hippo to begin, and then they confirmed that subsequent councils confirmed that decision, and at the Council of Trent it was said this is the Bible. Okay, and so we'll go down. Let's go down to the. Um, Protestant canon, and there are some in the room that are coming from a Protestant tradition, and they say that the Catholic Church added books to the Bible, and that's not true at all, okay? And here's the explanation. It says, you know, we say there's 46 Old Testament, and the Protestants say there's 39, okay? So it says the Jews, living a few centuries before Christ, were divided in two groups, those in Palestine, speaking Hebrew, and then the ones that were scattered uh, by the dis dis diaspora, and they were speaking Greek. So we had two groups of Jews. And in several centuries before, the Jews in the bottom par paragraph in Palestine re-examined and eliminated um, some of the books. The Jews eliminated some of the books from the existing collection as not in harmony with the law of Moses. Turn the page. Okay, they came up with four criteria. This is the Jews, not Protestants or Catholics. This is the Jews. And so the Jews said, those are the four things that the, every, everything in the Bible had to be in harmony with the Pentateuch, the first five. It had to have been written before the time of Ezra, had it been written in the language called Hebrew, not Aramaic, and it, it, it had to have been written in Palestine, in the land of Palestine. And so the next part, the application of those arbitrary criteria eliminated seven books. So the seven books of wisdom, first and second Maccabees, they were eliminated because they're written in Greek and not Hebrew. Then you have Tobit and parts of uh, Esther and um, Daniel that uh, were written in Aramaic and probably outside the land of Palestine. And there were other things there. And so the seven books that are in question, you know, the seven books that a Protestant would say we added, no, 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 they were there from the beginning and the Jews took them out. And then the Protestants, they said, we're gonna take them out too. Martin Luther says, we're gonna take them out too. And that's okay. Okay, we call them deuterocanonical, second canon. Proto-canon is all the books that we agree on, the 39 books. But this, the other books, we would say they're good for reading. We believe that they're God's word. And so no big deal. And so see, Luther rejected the deuterocanonical books of the Old Testament. And at one time he eliminated even more. So in his error, he wanted to throw out Hebrews, James, Jude, and the uh, book of Revelation, the apocalypse. And so Later, Protestants reinserted them, and today Catholics and uh, Protestant New Testaments are identical. Thank goodness. Okay, so the New Testament is one to one. And there's the languages there. I just mentioned Hebrew and Greek, and there was Aramaic, and that's the languages that were in writing in those times. And let's see. Um, can you imagine? We're so used to talking about chapter and verse, and that wasn't from the beginning. You know, there had to be a way. And when you hear the early uh, bishops in that talk, they say somewhere in scripture, it says this because there was no way to identify where somewhere was. Can you imagine? And so here was, look at the top of the other page, the right-hand column. Um, it says the Archbishop of Canterbury in the 13th century first divided the Bible into chapters, okay? And then Santes Paginias divided the Old Testament into verses in 1528. So 1500 years. And then they're finally dividing it into um, chapters and verses so that we can have ready reference to it. When we talk about it, we can go right to where we're talking about. It's Matthew, it's um, 16, 16, and we know what we're talking about. I thought that was so amazing. I never really knew for a long time where, when did they divide this so that it's easy to talk about, okay? Let's look over and turn to uh, two more pages. And um, now we're talking about inspiration. It says inspiration of the Bible. See if you can find that on the right-hand column, very good. And just another reiterates, it says, the books of the Bible have as their principal author the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. That's God, who is perfect, and he wants us to know the truth. So under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, these men and women wrote down um, what God wanted us to know. Let's turn the page again. On the bottom, it says, ancient manuscripts of the Bible, left-hand side. So on the bottom, it says, the oldest Hebrew manuscript known is the copy of Isaiah, you know, the greatest prophet, and it's written in Hebrew, and we have that. It's from the second century, so in the 100s, we have some parchment from Isaiah, so great, and uh, it goes on. And then we have to start to, with the translations, okay? Uh, the first, most important early translation of the Bible was the Septuagint, okay? 
And that's where the Greek translation of the Old Testament was begun. Okay. And so remember the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. So they translated it into Greek because the people were now speaking Greek. So the first translation to spread the news of the Old Testament into a Greek speaking culture was in 250. Okay. 250 BC. And then uh, down further there, the Bible in the first two centuries after Jesus, okay? An early translation from Greek to Latin was needed because the Romans were Latin. And so now it had to be translated from Greek to Latin. And so that took place. But the real um, most important part was in the 300s. So you go down to the bottom of the page, St. Jerome, a Catholic saint that we revere, St. Jerome, he spent 34 years devoting his time to the Bible and uh, the Old Testament from Hebrew to Latin, he translated it and it was done over a period of 15 years. <laughs> you know, we're so used to walking up to something and getting it out, like either a copy or something. It took him 15 years to look at the Hebrew text and translate it into, into Latin so that everybody could read it. That's the Old Testament. And then let's look again to the next group of pages there. By the ninth century, I remember we did this in the 4th century, the 300s. Now in the 9th century, Jerome's version was assumed as the people's Bible. That's what the word Vulgate means. Okay. And then all the way to the 1500s, the Council of Trent designated the Vulgate as the official church translation. Okay. And then we look at the right-hand side. Now we have the printing press, you know. And so Gutenberg in 1450 uh, had developed the art of printing, duplication. And the first book that he wanted to print was the Bible, okay? And he did the uh, Latin translation. About two years were spent in doing that. And uh, so in the year 1452, the first Bible was printed by reproduction of the Gutenberg Press, okay? First English translation appeared in the 14th century. So it's the 1300s. Okay, then we turn the pages again and go to Wycliffe's translation. The first complete and printed English uh, translation at the turn of the 16th century. And it was translated, the New Testament was done in Reims, France, and the Old Testament was done in Douai. And so it's called the Douai-Reims Bible. But you can see how much time has passed before it was really readily translated into the English language from all those other languages, okay? On the right-hand side, we see the King James. Many of our Protestant brothers and sisters use the King James translation, and that took place in 1611 but there were many mistakes. So Protestants themselves recognized the many serious defects in the translation. And so the, what they call the revised King James Version was 200 years later in 1881 to 1885. And so the uh, revised King James Version is still available, okay? And uh, there's another one in 1952. So let's turn one more page and we're almost at the end. And then the, uh, the Catholic Church had a confraternity middle of the page there to get a good translation of the Bible. And so let me just put a little guide up here. So if you have the Old Testament and it's really originally written in Hebrew, and then the translation was to Latin, and then the translation was to English, and then the New Testament, which was written in Greek, was translated and into Latin and then into English. And so the church is saying at that time, the church is saying, let's go right from the original language to where we want to be. So we're going to go right from Hebrew to English and we're going to go right from Greek to English. You see, every time you translate something, you have the opportunity to really chip, shift the meaning, to lose some of the power or lose some of the meaning. And so if you go from language to language to language and then to German, and all, by the time you get out here, it's like, oh man. So uh, I think it was a very wise thing to do. And so in modern times here, in 1970, so the bottom down there, the introduction of the New American Bible, the one that the church uses today, has this translation where they, the translation was done from the original native language of the people all the way to English. And so we've got it as accurate as we can do as accurate as we can use. And so 1978 was begun and, and completed in 1986. Okay. That's a lot, I know, but it was just hopefully a high level on the origin and the inspiration of the Holy Bible. And uh, 
what I'd like to point out with that translation idea there, and I think we might have one of these up there, please, or Ryan, if we do, and we'll just show them on this. If you take out that sheet, it's a one sheet and it has many highlights and underlines on it. It says various translations. It might be in your binder, you might not see it, the uh, part of that. And let's just see if we can put it on our big screen. Okay, if not, did y'all have it? Y'all have this one? Good job, good job. Okay, what I'd like to do, let's, I would like to do the, the back side of it. So let's look at the back side first. These are different Bibles, different Bible translations of one verse. The verse is John 6, 53. So it's chapter 6, verse 53. And I want you to just get an idea of how many different ways it could be said. It's all written in the same Greek. So all these different churches are looking at the Greek and they're putting it in words that they think are correct. And so, good. And so let's do this. Beautiful. This is the back page of that. So see, that would be the King, new King James Version. And so the translation, I'm just going to make some comparisons, okay? You have no life in you. Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Now, another translation called the New Living Translation said, you cannot have eternal life within you. That's different. And here's another translation down here. The Tyndale translation says, you shall not have life in you, okay? And now, please go to the other page there, Ryan, if you would. Good. Now, here's another translation, God's Word. It says, you don't have the source of life in you. The good news says, you will, you will not have life in yourselves. The Hebrew names version says, you don't have life in yourselves. And this says, you won't have real life in you. Can you see that there's little nuances there that they're different? I think you can see that. It's like, wow, it's the same Greek. And then we have these different translations. And then even at the beginning, so let's take a look over here. You know, when Jesus says this, and it's been beautiful movies. And Jesus in one movie will say, verily, verily, I say to you, or truly, truly, I say to you, or amen, amen. And so it depends on how they do it. I know, yes, indeed, uh, amen, amen, I guarantee this truth, I am telling the truth, most assuredly, what I'm about to tell you is true, and so folks, that's where, you know, th th there's the opportunity when you do the different translations, you can have different, maybe potential different meanings, you know, you don't have life, you will not have life, you won't have real life, and so there's little nuances there, and so you'd like to want to trust the ones that really did the translation, and, and go with that, so Thanks for listening on that. So as far as the scriptures, let me just see. I want to honor your time here. Let's see. I have some questions at the end here. Um, well, here's the language again, and just some to show you the scale of how long it took. You know, uh, 400 AD is when the Latin was readable from the native language of Hebrew and then Douay Reims, where uh, Latin and Greek were put into English and the New American, which is kind of modern day. Please, Ryan, let's go to the next one. Who wrote the New Testament? Catholics. <laughs> so I just, you know, there's 27 books and they're all written by Catholics. All the books, you know, first, yeah, first and second Peter. Peter was the first Pope. And so he reigned for 34 years and Peter wrote those. Paul, as I said, he wrote, um, you know, uh, 14 letters of the New Testament. And so Paul was Catholic, very Catholic. And so who wrote the New Testament? All of those writers, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're all Catholic. Okay, next question. Who translated the New Testament, okay? When St. Jerome spent 15 years to translate the, the, uh, the Bible from the native languages of Hebrew and, and Greek into um, Latin so that it would be universal all over the world. And so Catholics. The next question, okay. Who assembled the New Testament? Remember, you have all these letters and books. Many of them didn't make it. And so uh, who did that? It was the bishops got together at various councils, okay? Uh, and so they uh, determined under the guidance of the Holy Spirit that these are the books that God wanted us to have that were truly written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And that's it. And it was the, done at a council where the bishops got together and prayed and made that decision. So that's who assembled it. And then who protected it, I think? Who preserved the New Testament? It was the Catholic Church. There was many times, you know, where uh, through all the crusades and all of the wars that took place and all that, who preserved the Bible in its integrity? And it was the Catholic Church, okay? And um, 
you could say it's a very Catholic book. Okay, the New Testament for sure. Okay, so we're going to take a peek. We're going to shift gears. And boy, if there's any questions on this, folks, just to honor your time, I want to talk a little bit about this other book that's very helpful, very helpful. And uh, we use it a lot. And it's called The Catechism. So just briefly, let's uh, go through some of the definitions. I think we'll look at a few definitions at a high level. And we'll see. The word catechism, that's a word you may have never heard before. What does it mean? It's a summary, as I said, of all the teachings of the church in the areas of faith and morals. Okay, There's no other topic in here. It's not about farming. It's not about a marketing. It's not about that. It's about what do we believe as Catholic Christians in the area of faith okay, and morals. Let's go to the next one, please. Catechesis. That's educating others in the faith. You know, so when I'm teaching you, that's called catechesis. When we have our Sunday school kids, we're teaching them, that's called catechesis. It's training them. The next word is catechist. So you would call them the leaders that are teaching our children, certainly in school, and even myself, a person teaching the faith to others. That's what we're doing. Okay, the next one, catechumen. A catechumen would be a person who is preparing for baptism. And so in this room, there are some people that are not baptized in this room. And so if you're not baptized, you would be called a catechumen. Okay, you're on the journey and you're yet to be born again, born again into God's family. And if you choose to do that, then you would become one of the baptized. You would become a Christian, a follower of Christ. So a catechumen is a person who is preparing for baptism. Then another word we use is candidate. A candidate is a person who is baptized. They're born again. They're in God's family as a Christian, but they're seeking to embrace another faith tradition like the Catholic Church. And so they're preparing to make a profession of faith and then enter the Catholic Church. And there are many in this room that did that recently. And so they were baptized. We don't rebaptize. You're only adopted once by God. And then they make a profession of faith. I believe and profess all that the Holy Catholic Church teaches is true. And then you can come in. And then we give you confirmation and Holy Communion and many, many graces, okay? So those are some words that we may be using in our, our, our presentations here. And that'll give you a little understanding of what that is. And so please, the next one then, Ryan, let's see where we are. When we use the big word magisterium, it comes from the Latin word magistra, and that means teacher. And so we say that the, there is a teaching authority of the church started by God and it's based on Peter, the Pope, and then the bishops who surround him. So all the bishops, there's 300 in America, there's 3,000 in the world. These would be called the shepherds of the people and they are the teaching authority of the church. There's the shepherd and then there's the priests that work with the shepherd and then there's deacons. So there's a hierarchy there of bishops and priests and deacons. And the magisterium would be the teaching authority of the church, okay? With a direct line going all the way back to Peter and Christ. Okay, so who wrote the catechism? The bishops got together. And the latest version is 1992. So this was in 1992. And they wanted to have it done 30 years after the um, last council, Vatican Council II, which was 1962. And uh, we can go on its great, great strides in the church. So it was um, the teaching authority who wrote that book. Okay, what's the next one, please? Okay, when we talk about the church and why we would ever want to believe, you know, what the church has to say in scripture or in the catechism, we refer to a passage such as in Matthew 18. In Matthew 18, Jesus is saying to the apostles, he says, if a person has a conflict or whatever and you're trying to correct it, and if this person refuses to listen to the guys trying to settle the conflict, he says, tell the church. If he refuses to listen even to the church, then treat him as you would a Gentile or a tax collector. They're, they're outside of the possibility of entering into the mystery of the faith. And so the church would be the um, magisterium, it would be the people of God guided and governed by the magisterium. So when we say that, the magisterium. Okay, the next one, Ryan. Even in First Timothy, Paul is writing this. He's ready to a bishop. He made Timothy a bishop. He ordained him and he says, but if I should be delayed, you should know how to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the foundation of truth. God is truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He started this church, and so he wanted us to grow in the truth, grow in our knowledge and love of him. And so who is the, um, who is the repository of that? It's the church. The church is the pillar and the foundation of truth. And we have some of our Protestant brothers and sisters, and they say, this is the pillar and foundation of truth, you know, scripture. And 
this is very important. This is the holy word of God. Jesus, I mean, it's written, in, um, I think Jerome said, he said, ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ. I mean, this is precious. Like when we're done reading the gospel on Sunday, we kiss the word. I mean, this is precious, okay? But the Bible never said that this is all that there is, okay? And so we would say the pillar and foundation of truth is the church. And that's what St. Paul said in scripture. He said this. He said the pillar and foundation of truth is the church, not the Bible. The Bible is an important part of the church, but it is not the pillar and foundation of truth. The church is. Okay, please go to the next one there, Ryan. Okay. This is put out by Pope John Paul the Great, and many of you know, even if you're non-Catholic, you know he, um, I think 27 years he reigned as the Pope, and uh, just, just a great a leader, just loved by everyone around the world, and he's the one that uh, asked for this to be done, to be put together, and it came out in 1992. He was still the Pope. Okay, let's go to the next one, please. Okay, in this book, and it looks a little intimidating, but like I say, it's a resource book. It's like an encyclopedia. There's four parts to it, four main parts. And these are the four parts, okay? You have the profession of faith, like what do we believe? When we, at church, we say the creed. On Sunday, we, in our church liturgy, we say we're gonna say the creed. Creed comes from the Latin word credo, which means I believe. And that's how we started. I believe, what do you believe in? I believe in one God the Father Almighty. And so we go through that. We break open our profession of faith in here and we go right through the creed. I believe in God. I believe in Jesus, the only Son of God. I believe in His Holy Spirit. I believe in the church. And so there's great ways to really unpack that and to go through what we believe, like through the Apostles' Creed, okay? And then the next is, part two, is the liturgy. How we celebrate on Sunday Mass. We call it the sacred liturgy. And what does that mean? And it's broken apart and it includes the seven sacraments. And just real briefly, we have classes on the sacraments next after January. And the sacrament is we, a channel that God is able to pour down grace and mercy into our souls, okay? A sacrament is a visible sign of the invisible reality of God's love and mercy. And there are seven. We say the church, we have, that God has given us seven. And the first one is what? Who knows the first sacrament? Baptism, Right? I mean, you have to be born again into God's family to then open that door. Now you're a Christian, and now God can pour great graces in there, okay? And so the first one is baptism. And then the other ones, you know, we have holy communion, we have holy confession, holy anointing, holy orders, holy matrimony, and there's uh, other channels that God uses to give us grace. Then the Christian way of life is part three. So in part three, this is what's the moral law? And uh, how many commandments did Moses give us? the Ten Commandments. They have a beautiful movie about it. And so we would say that's part of the moral law of God. And we break that open in here. Commandment one, two, three, four, five. And we look at it in detail. So to explore and examine the depth of the Ten Commandments, it's in the catechism. And then finally prayer. So many people say, I know I'm not praying as I should. I need to pray more. And so one beautiful prayer is the prayer Jesus gave us, which is the Our Father. We call it the Lord's Prayer. And that prayer is in here and it's line by line and explored. You know, what did God want us to do, or how do you want us to understand his love and um, the way we can approach him by praying that prayer? So it's in here, the Our Father. And so what does that do? If you look at that, we have the end game of all of that. Please, if you would, Ryan. So it's about our faith. And so the first part of the catechism is about faith believed, then faith celebrated. As we gather together and we celebrate our faith, faith lived, the Ten Commandments, you shall not kill, you know, you shall not steal, you shall not lie. How do you live in the world, you know? Those are faith lived and then faith nourished, where we uh, meet God in the quiet of our heart in, in prayer. And so it's a beautiful compilation uh, that, you, that is a great, great resource as you're on the journey to go closer to God. Okay, let's look at the next one, please. It's got a great index, as I said. This is the back of the book. And uh, in most any topic that you want in faith or morals is in there. Okay. And the, the great reference is up. Take a look up here, folks. You would CCC. When we put that up there for we're teaching you, we'd say CCC is this Catechism of the Catholic Church. And then we would look at 2204. That's the paragraph. This is all broken up in paragraphs and they're all numbered in here. So it's Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 2204. But if you want to find it real quick, it gives you the page number two, page 589. Beautiful. And so when we do this, as the classes go on, you'll know what we're talking about when we give you paragraph and page number. Okay, what are the three pillars of the Catholic Church? We've talked about sacred scripture. We've talked about sacred tradition. 
and we've talked about the magisterium. And a beautiful way to look at this is if you had a three-legged stool. I think we have a picture here. You know, you need all three to keep it balanced, to keep it up. You know, if you take out one of the legs, it falls down. And so all three of the dimensions of the Catholic faith, scripture, tradition, and magisterium are what God has designed to uphold what it is, uh, the Catholic Christian life. Okay. When were the traditions of the Catholic Church first written down? And I think I have a copy of the DDK, okay? When the apostles got together right after our Lord died in 33, the first thing they wrote down was the teaching of the 12 apostles. We have copies of them, okay? So it's called the DDK. That's a Greek word, DDK, okay? About the year 65, and see, it was even 30 years after he died. It's beautiful. And so there are great teachings in here that have been unchanged from the very beginning. They heard it from him, Jesus, and they wrote it down into this. It's called the teaching of the 12 apostles. And um, it's a beautiful. I'm referring to that here. We have that copy. Okay. How big is the Catholic Church in America today? Well, it's about 22% of the people. You know, you don't know that from the South, but where I was in Chicago, I didn't know non-Catholics growing up. I mean, there was a great shift. There's many Catholics in the North and not in the South, but I think we have some numbers here. I think, you know, there's 70 million people in the United States claim the Catholic faith, okay? And that's out of, I think, 340 million or whatever the number is now in America. How big is the Catholic Church in the world today? It's about 1.3 billion people, okay? In the world today, there's 7 billion people. And so 1.3 billion, um, one out of seven, are Catholic in the world, okay? And what's our next one, please, there, uh, Ryan? And just as we come to a close, folks, I wanna invite you, you don't have to be Catholic to come into our church. You can go in that church, it's open all day long, and you can pray. God, it's God's house. And many people find great comfort. We begin with mass in the morning at 645. And but it's open all day. People come and go and they pray in God's house. And we have formal, we have masses, as we say, at Holy Spirit, that's our church, and then our sister parish, which is on the university. But we have mass weekdays 645 every day. And then on Sunday, we have 845. And then we have an 11. And then one o'clock is in Spanish. And uh, we're live streaming the ones that are underlined. And then at St. Francis, they have similar, 8.45 and 11 on Sunday, and they have a different schedule for the week. So you are welcome to come. You do not have to pray our creed. You may not believe, or you probably believe most of it, you know, and if you want to say that, that's fine. You don't feel any pressure. We have a moment at the end where we come forward for Holy Communion. We just ask you, if you're not Catholic, just to come forward and receive. Everybody can get a blessing. You come forward with your hands on your heart, and I would give you a blessing, and many people do. And so don't feel alone. But just come and be wide open to what is taught, what is preached, the beautiful prayers and what we're doing. And if we get down to that, that outline there where we really talk about the Mass, then you really get to see that everything we do has a meaning. Everything we do has purpose. You know, when I elevate the host at the end and we're offering Jesus, we believe that is truly Jesus. We're offering to the Father. We're representing what he did. See, he offered himself to the Father, okay, on, on the day of Calvary. And so... He said, do this in memory of me. And so through the great mystery of the mass, we're offering Jesus again and again to the Father, along with all of our intentions that we lift up in the middle of the mass and our very selves, our very selves. We're saying, I'm, with, I'm offering myself to you through your son, truly present here. We're offering ourselves to you. And it gives the Father great glory. And it's the most powerful prayer in the world. And you're invited to participate in that. There's great graces flowing. Even if you're not Catholic, come into his house and ask for God to come into your heart. He can do anything, okay? So don't feel you have to be Catholic. But the only two things is please don't receive communion unless and until you ever come become Catholic and uh, just feel at peace, okay? And so is there any more here, Ryan? Did I have yet another one? Or, uh, may okay, we have a little snippet. We showed a video last time and there's some new people here, but I, it was, went so quick and everything. It's just... Uh, the Catholic Church. It's just a beautiful, powerful message. And we'll show that now. I'll dim the lights here. And I think we'll just close with the glory be. And uh, I'll turn these lights down over here, I think. And what was the volume on that one there, Ryan, that I need to... Okay.
Our family has spanned the centuries and the globe. With God's grace, we started hospitals to care for the sick. We established orphanages and helped the poor. We are the largest charitable organization on the planet, bringing comfort to those in need. We educate more children than any other institution. We developed the scientific method and founded the college system. We defend the dignity of human life and uphold marriage. Guided by the Holy Spirit, we compiled the Bible. We are transformed by sacred scripture and sacred tradition, which, which have guided us for 2,000 years. We are the Catholic Church. With over one billion in our family, sharing in the sacraments and fullness of the Christian faith. Jesus started our church when he said to Peter, the first pope, You are rock, and upon this rock I will build my church. So if you've been away from the Catholic Church, we invite you to take another look. Visit catholicscomehome.org today. We are Catholic. Welcome home. Testing one two three. Okay, there we go. So we're just going to close. We have a little prayer called glory, and if you, if you know it, you can just say it, and then we'll just bless you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much for coming. Please be real safe. I, I live here so you can stay and ask questions if you'd like to. Thank you so much and come again. If, if you're interested in this, we'd love to have you. Thank you. Please be at peace. Thank you.